Luke is a detail person. He is a historian. And so he wants us to know exactly when it is that John the Baptist is preaching his sermon in the wilderness. These first several phrases in chapter 3 of his gospel give us those details. We read that in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip was ruler of the region of that other place and the one place over there, and that other guy was the ruler of that place, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we've been thinking about the songs that Luke includes in his version of Jesus' birth, um, each time so far, the character that we've been focusing on has been the singer of the song. It's not the case this week. The song that I just read, the Prepare the Way of the Lord in the Wilderness, that song is sung about John the Baptist. It was initially sung by the prophet Isaiah, who wrote this prophecy pointing us towards John. And it is noteworthy that all four Gospels include this prophecy and say that this prophecy is directly indicating John the Baptist. It doesn't happen that often that all four Gospels agree on one particular detail of the story. So it's pretty significant when that is the case. It is a beautiful song. Every valley shall be exalted. I can't read it without hearing the music of uh, George Frederick Handel, of course. Every valley shall be exalted. It's a beautiful poem. It it's, uh, flows. It's, it's just very expressive. And that should be a clue to us that it's absolutely not sung by John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist's words are not poetic and lovely and flow so smoothly into our ears. John the Baptist's words, his own words, are a bit harsh. And they have kind of a sharp edge to them. They are rough. They are challenging. They are the Bible's equivalent of that guy who stands there with the bullhorn on the street corner and yells at us as we walk by. John is that guy. The crowds come to hear him, to be baptized by him, and to be challenged by these words. Every year, every Advent, these words come up over and over again as we prepare for Christmas. In terms of preparing for Christmas, I like to think of John the Baptist's sermon as the equivalent of that great big ball of tangled up Christmas lights that we pull out of the box. You know what I mean, right? Unless you're just, you know, better homes and gardens kind of people, you have the best of intentions, you're going to get the house all decorated, and you're like, let's get the lights out, and you open the box, and you pull out this monstrosity of tangled everything, despite your best intentions last year, to put them away neatly, you pull this ball of, of lights out and spend the next 45 minutes cursing the Lord for, for how hard your life is. And then you finally get them plugged in and they don't work. I mean, that's how it always goes. That is John the Baptist. That is him, uh, his message to scripture is like a tangled ball of Christmas lights to our preparations. I wish we could just skip over this. I mean, I wish we could just get straight to the Christmas story, but it's, it's there, doggone it. And we can't just leave out parts of the Bible that are difficult for us to think about. Here we are just a few days away in this kind of fuzzy Christmassy mood and then boom, John the Baptist, his message comes in like an like alarm going off 
in the morning and we are having this great dream, it's like, please, just can I just press snooze one more time? Get up out of bed. We got to deal with it. Isaiah's song, every valley shall be exalted and all that jazz, Isaiah's song prepares us for what John has to say. It's the lead-in to John's sermon. And John's sermon, uh, boy, it's a whiz-bang kind of sermon. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I, um, he starts out, his lead-in, his opener is, you brood of vipers. So he calls his congregation a bunch of snakes right off the bat. I mean, I don't know where it's going to go from there, but... I've been preaching for 16 years. I've taken classes. I've read books. I've taught classes on preaching. Not once has it come up as a suggestion that you should start off insulting your congregation. I don't know. You bunch of idiots. What are you doing? I mean, I, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> How does that happen? But he, he gets away with it. You brood of vipers, he says. Who warned you to escape the coming retribution? Who warned you to escape the wrath to come? It's a rhetorical question because they know the answer. The answer is all the prophets who have ever come before. He's basically telling them, have you not been paying attention? Didn't you go to Sunday school? Haven't you studied scriptures? Who warned you? They know who warned them. They perfectly well know who warned them. How do you not get the message, said John? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. You've been saved, now show it. Bear fruit that proves you've been changed, that proves you're a different person. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. It's all well and good, but John wants to go deeper. He says, all right, let me lay, lay down this, this metaphor for you, all right? If you're not getting it yet, John continues on. It's all there in Luke chapter 3. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but Luke says, I mean, John says to his congregation, look, God has got an axe, a sharp one, and he's coming to chop down a few trees. Now listen, your life is a tree, and what God's doing is looking for the trees that are bearing good fruit. And the ones that aren't are getting cut down and being thrown into the fire. Merry Christmas. Oh, holy night. It's not warm and fuzzy. I don't like this. This makes me uncomfortable. But his audience gets it. They're like, okay, that's pretty good theology. I understand. Could you give us a practical example, though? This is pretty abstract. And John says, okay, I've got some practical examples for you. If you have two coats, give one away, because you don't need to. Anyone got two coats? I got like four. He goes on. I told you, it doesn't get any easier. He goes on. If you have more food than you need, give the extra away. Now, I want you right now to picture your refrigerator. Yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling it. See what I mean? I wish we could skip this. This is not good. This is not lovely and, you know, Christmassy. If you're a tax collector, said John, stop exploiting the system for selfish gain. You're a part of the system. Just do your job. Stop exploiting it so that you get more money out of it. Stop it. Just knock it off. Just do your job. If you're a soldier, says John, stop extorting money from people by intimidation and fear and threats. Stop rattling your saber and just do your job. For goodness sakes, just do your job. He's laying out tons of practical examples. He's like saying, you guys know this stuff. Just do it. So his audience gets that. They're like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. That sounds very challenging, though. So you must be the Messiah. You must be the one that we're waiting for. And John basically laughs at them and says, oh, oh, you think I'm the Messiah? No, 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 no. You ain't seen nothing yet. You think my sermon's hard to listen to. I'm baptizing you with water. The one who's coming after me is baptizing you with fire and the Holy Spirit. You think my stuff is hard. Just wait till you hear what he has to say. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Man, can't we skip this? Can't we just 
forget that it's there. But every single year, every single gospel, every single year, every Advent, this comes up. We're supposed to be preparing our way for Christ. And more of us turn to Pinterest to do that than to the Sermon of John the Baptist. We're getting ready for our Pinterest perfect Christmas to happen. And all of a sudden, John's like, hey, wait a minute. Your life is supposed to be different here. You're supposed to be bearing fruit worthy of repentance. Show me some of that. Dang it, John. This is so hard. How do we bring this metaphor to life? How do we make this real? I mean, it's hard. It's challenging. How do we not just rush past this to get to baby Jesus, who's much more manageable in our minds? He's adorable. How do we dwell here with John's message to make sure that we truly are preparing for Christ? What is this fruit we're supposed to be bearing anyway? What is this good fruit of the Spirit? How do we produce this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? How do we do that? One way is to remember that Isaiah's song, the place we started out initially, Isaiah's song is telling us that, that what John is preaching here is designed to help us prepare for the arrival of Christ. All right, so how do we prepare for this arrival? How do we pre prepare for an arrival in general? I heard a story once about two groups of people that were preparing for an arrival. This, this may help, may not. Two towns. Let's just say there are two towns. Both towns are told that a special and honored guest is going to be arriving and that they should begin preparations immediately for the arrival of this honored guest. Town number one has a meeting, and they say at this meeting, hey, we don't want to miss this arrival, so let's be on the lookout for this honored guest, this special guest, this celebrity who's going to be coming into our town, so what should we look for? Well, you know, this special guest, obviously, you know, celebrities never travel alone. They always have a posse. Is that what it's called? They always have an entourage with them. They always have peeps <laughs> that are with them. So we look for a big group, you know. We look for um, a motorcade. It's going to be probably a black suburban with tinted windows in front, some kind of fancy limo, another black suburban in back with the security personnel. We're going to look for this arrival, this fanfare. There's going to be trumpets. I don't know. There's going to be something special. We'll see it. We'll look for this special honored guest. And so everyone in town number one began immediately looking for what they expected this honored guest would look like. Town number two, they also had a meeting and they also said, you know, we don't want to miss this arrival. Someone said, I got an idea. So that we won't miss it, maybe we should just welcome every single person who comes as if they are that honored guest. Then we will have welcomed them, even if we don't know what they look like, even if we don't, can't recognize them. If we just recognized all of our guests and received them as if they were the honored guest, then they, we would be sure not to miss it. Well, you know what happens in the story, right? Town number one, they all spend their time looking for the entourage, looking for the glitz and the glamour, looking for the celebrity. They spend their time looking for what they expect an honored guest might look like. In the meantime, normal people like you and me arrive in town number one and are made to feel secondary, are made to feel like we don't matter. As this town is looking for someone, they greet us. They say, hey, how you doing? Nice to have you here. And then immediately turn their attention onto their own expectations of what an honored guest truly looks like. As a result, all the normal people who visit town number one don't stay there, because why would they? And they drift away, and the town ages, and eventually dies, dies off. Meanwhile, in town number two, all of the people have been welcomed with open arms. All of the people have been greeted with love and grace. They have been made to feel like they are special and honored guests. And guess what? They stay. Not only do they stay as a part of this town, they say, I want to be a part of that. And they start welcoming others as well. And they turn that love outward and make those connections with those guests as they continue to arrive. And the town grows and flourishes and becomes a vibrant metropolis. Now, I can't help but think that the connections 
that town number two was making. Those connections of hospitality and grace and love and acceptance for all people. I can't help but think that that is the fruit that God wants us to bear in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all those spiritual fruits, that's what is being generated with that kind of welcome, with that kind of hospitality, with that kind of grace and openness to others. May we, as God's church, always seek to be welcoming others, not not while we're expecting someone else to arrive, but welcoming others as if they themselves are none other than the presence of Jesus Christ. Welcoming others as if they are Christ, as if we are the body of Christ together, joining together to be the love of God incarnate in this world. There is indeed a song in the air. It is a love song, a song of God's grace made real in the birth of Jesus Christ.